So Bill, feel free to take it away. And thank you so much for being here. We are delighted to have you share your expertise with us. Uh, pleasure to be here. The video captioning platforms are quite interesting. Zoom is an absolute nightmare for deaf and hard of hearing accessibility. In fact, they have been sued uh, for the nightmare that exists for deaf and hard of hearing accessibility. With respect to Zoom, they have a beta system that works real well, but if you don't have the beta system, it becomes really crazy in trying to get the captions integrated into Zoom. It's not unusual to have the captioning with a delay of anywhere from 22 to 46 seconds between the spoken word and the captioning when it comes to Zoom, unless the you're aware of how to insert it into Zoom properly. Uh, Microsoft Teams is a bit better um, than uh, Zoom in that the captioning works well, but they have issues too. Uh, one of the issues they have is that if two people, two organizations have have uh, Microsoft Teams, it's possible the captioning won't work at all. They're working on that. The best for video conferencing access at the moment is Google Meets, which uh, has fantastic automatic speech recognition. And <clears throat> I, they have an extension that apparently will generate a transcript I haven't tried it yet, but the captioning can also vary in terms of its size, which Teams can't. So if Zoom is going to be making its captioning available next month, that's perhaps because they've been sued off their rocker, and maybe they realized they had to move it up. So appreciate you all joining me. What I thought I would do today is I would just go over the internet accessibility different approaches and talk briefly about the Online Accessibility Act and then throw it open to question, could we only have a half hour? You should have a more comprehensive set of PowerPoint slides. Um, as uh, I mentioned, my practice is divided into a representation side where I'll give legal advice. I will occasionally co-counsel with others. The larger part of my practice is on the consulting side. I do a lot of training, a lot of these webinars, have my blog, which is the favorite part of my practice. I will serve as an ADA compliance expert uh, witness, consulting expert or consultant on ADA and related AD, uh, disability discrimination litigation around the country. So I, I do both of those things in my practice. So at any rate, internet accessibility, the wild west of internet accessibility litigation breaks down into four different possibilities. The first possibility is that if you have a website, because it is not a physical place, you don't have to worry about whether your website is accessible. That come from a case called Access Now versus Southwest Airlines. That case has been overruled by the Department of Transportation regulations. The second possibility comes from dicta in a Seventh Circuit case called Doe versus Mutual of Omaha, where it said the electronic space is subject to the ADA. The third possibility comes from a district court case that's been expanded upon by the Ninth Circuit, where the um, National Federation of Blind versus Target, and then there's several courts that have fallen along those lines, which is if your internet site is a gateway to the physical brick and mortar store, then the internet site has to be accessible. So that's the, that's the uh, third possibility. The fourth possibility comes from uh, Netflix case, there's also a case involving Squib D that settled, and they both came out of the, um, they both were in the Massachusetts, I believe, uh, area, district courts in Massachusetts, and the, the uh, line there is if it is a place of public accommodation in 42 USC 121817, that is a type of thing going on in that section then it must be accessible to people with disabilities. The Supreme Court of the United States had made it very, very clear in a case that had nothing to do with the ADA that they would be quite likely to follow the Netflix Scrib D approach 
uh, which is that if it is a, if a place of public accommodation type of what's happening in a place of public accommodation, then that website must be accessible. The DOJ has already said in a friend of the court brief uh, that was actually filed under the Trump administration that that's the approach they're going to take. The reason the Supreme Court will take that approach is if you look at the case South Dakota versus Wayfair, which actually had nothing to do with the ADA at all. That was a case where Wayfair, which I'm sure you all are familiar with from the TV commercials, selling a whole bunch of furniture to folks in South Dakota. South Dakota said that we want to tax you all because you are sending in furniture like crazy into our state and we want to tax you. Uh, Wayfair said we're not physically located in your state, so we don't have to pay the taxes went all the way to the United States Supreme Court and the United States Supreme Court said, no, wait a minute, you're sending in all that furniture, you have to pay the taxes. What's significant about that case is that in literally, and I've counted them up, I have a blog entry on this, literally 23 different statements make it really, really clear that an internet site uh, is, can be a place of public accommodation. So I think this, the handwriting is on the wall between the Supreme Court decision in South Dakota versus Wayfair and the DOJ and its amicus brief involving uh, whether a vending machine was a place of public accommodation and telling the Supreme Court, no, don't hear the case, but here's our view on it, which matches the uh, <coughs> Scrib D and Netflix view. I think the handwriting's on the wall. If you have a client that is involved, that is doing any one of those things in 121817 and has an internet site that is not accessible, meaningfully accessible to people with disabilities, I think they're asking for it. The uh, other thing, <clears throat> so how do you make your internet site meaningfully accessible? The gold standard is WCAG 2.1 level AA. So web content accessibility guideline 2.1 level AA. That's the gold standard. But depending on the disability, even that gold standard may not result in meaningfully accessibility. So the best thing you can do for your internet site is A, design it from the get-go in a manner consistent with WCAG 2.1 level AA, and then B, have it beta tested by a group of people with disabilities to see if it works. When it comes to internet accessibility, you're really dealing with three different groups. First group you're dealing with is uh, the blind. Uh, they use screen reading technology, oftentimes JAWS. Second group you're dealing with is the deaf, uh, captioning. The so if you have any video and it's not captioned, you're asking for trouble. Um, the third group that you're dealing with, which often gets forgotten, is voice dictation users. If it works for screen readers, it should work for voice dictation users, but not necessarily. I've seen that myself. I use voice dictation. I have joint issues, so I try not to use a mouse or type. Um, if it works for voice dictation users, it may not work for screen readers. So those are the three types of people with disabilities that you're thinking about. Uh, the final thing I wanna talk about, and then I wanna have plenty of time to throw it open for questions, is the Online Accessibility Act was proposed last legislative session in Congress. I have a blog entry on it. Uh, it's now been proposed again. Without amendments, I don't see it going anywhere, particularly with the change in administration. It just doesn't realize that Web Content Accessibility Guideline 2.1 Level AA is not the same thing as meaningfully accessible. So there would have to be some amendments. Maybe there will be. So um, as far as regulation, there are none. The Obama administration have put out a bunch of regulations. Then the Trump administration came in. They not they uh, took the regulation down and then they put the whole thing on inactive status. Will the Biden administration reactivate those regulations? Maybe. Um, it's a real problem for businesses because when it comes to figuring out whether your website is meaningfully accessible, it is truly a wild west. You have no idea. You really have no idea 
as to what is ADA compliance short of WCAG 2.1 level AA being a gold standard, but that's not a legal standard. You have no regulation. Every person with a disability deals with the issue of uh, accessibility differently. So that's where you're at. So for right now, I would say as a takeaway, as a matter of preventive law, when you're dealing with internet accessibility, the thing you wanna ask is, is it a type of business in 121817? There's 12 different categories. If it is, you wanna have your website accessible. Uh, that would mean as a gold standard looking to 2.1 WCAG level AA. Um, doing it from the ground up is a lot better than doing it from uh, the ground later. It's always harder to fix. If you don't do this, you the uh, one of the biggest growth areas in ADA litigation is exactly this, internet accessibility. Uh, legal fees for paying the other side, legal fees for an accessibility ranges anywhere from three to $20,000, depending on the type of lawsuit. And then you have to pay your attorney fees. So there's an incentive to do this. Uh, outside of the compliance piece, it's just the right thing to do. People with disabilities have money to spend. And do you really want to have your business or your law firm or whatever uh, not accessible to people with disabilities? You're, there's opportunities you're losing. So I will throw it up to any questions. And um, I know I'm coming through because I see the captioning of my own voice. So if there's any questions, feel free to ask. The, uh, the ADA is 50 miles wide and 50 miles deep. Uh, one of the things that I do in my practice, which is unusual, is I do Title I, Title II, Title III, constitutional law, and Title V, as well as ADA-related laws, such as the Fair Housing Act, Air Carrier Access Act, uh, all of that. But uh, another thing to keep in mind is that these ADA titles all have different rules. So one, one, two, and three do not have the same rules. They have different ways they go about their business. So sometimes I've seen attorneys make the mistake of saying, oh, I know Title I, I can do a Title II or Title III case. It doesn't work that way. Any questions? I can certainly fill up the time if there's no questions. Um, practical resources for small business owners is a question. The one depends on what you're looking for. If you're looking for a overview of the ADA in terms of a practical primer on the ADA, that's why I wrote my book. My book came out in 2013 from the American Bar Association. You can get it on Amazon. You probably can get it through the American Bar Association too. I update my book in real time with my blog, understandingtheada.com. So if you go there, you can see my book is basically being updated in real time. Another hot issue out there is the whole issue of service animals. I've got quite a bit of writing on that in my blog. The blog that I literally just posted today deals with an interesting issue. I don't know if any of y'all practice criminal law, but what happens if you have a witness who has to testify with a service animal in a criminal matter. And the defense says, well, that interfered with my right to a fair trial or the confrontation clause. That actually happened in a case out of Illinois in, um, in December of 2020, last year. So uh, that's the blog that I have for this week. So I would suggest my book as a primer, and then I would suggest my blog updates it in real time. As far as website accessibility goes, uh, the WCAG 2.1 is on the internet site. It's really complicated. It's uh, really a dream for coders, but as far as it's there, anybody can get it. Um, far as um, accessibility of the website, I was on web WordPress for years, 
and they had a particular theme. Not all their themes are accessible to people with disabilities, so you have to dig into that. And they had a, uh, they did have a theme that was accessible to people with disabilities. I was doing that for years, and then that theme no longer became supported. I fortunately was able to find a company called Lexblog, and they take care of all the accessibility issues behind the scenes. I've got that built into my contract with them. It would be difficult for me to have a website, blog website, that wasn't accessible considering what I do for a living. So uh, Lexblog take care of that. So uh, WordPress is there, but you have to be uh, careful to make sure you choose a theme that uh, is accessible to people with disabilities. Not all the themes are. As far as how it works, WordPress does work pretty well uh, for, I use it through voice dictation for years. It worked, it worked very well that way. But um, so that's something you wanna investigate. Uh, Lexblog, uh, they are a blog aggregator, but they also do blog slash web, uh, websites for attorneys. And um, like I said, they the accessibility part is something they take care of. And uh, I've been just thrilled with Lexblog because not only are they taking care of the accessibility part, um, they're a blog aggregator. So I, I think my I'm getting out to many more people than I was getting out through with, with WordPress. Uh, for the four possibilities I mentioned at the beginning in terms of how the ADA goes. All right, the first possibility that if it is not a physical place, uh, you don't worry about it. That is an outlier. Absolutely nobody going that way anymore. The second possibility that the electronic space is always subject to the ADA, that's also an outlier. That's not happening either. The two areas that where you're dealing with, depending on the jurisdiction, and you just have to look at your jurisdiction, the two areas that you're dealing with are the gateway theory and what is a gateway depend from court to court. Um, so that's one possibility. And the other possibility is the Department of Justice amicus brief and where the Supreme Court has telegraphed that it's likely to go in 23 different ways, which is if your business is doing one of those things in 42 USC 121817, then your website has to be meaningfully accessible. So when you get right down to it, you're really looking at, is your jurisdiction a gateway jurisdiction? or is your jurisdiction a um, whatever is happening in 121817 jurisdiction? As a matter of preventive law, again, level AA WCAG 2.1 is where you want to go, but that is not the be all and end all because for example, WCAG, is not all that specific about how do you deal with voice dictation users such as myself and it can get uh, you can get into very particular questions so the 42 usc 12187 1817 is divided into 12 different categories and to be covered under ada title three you have to fall into one of those categories, but the list that's in those categories is not exclusive. Any other questions? Still have about five minutes. No, I just had a question on the- uh, As far as uh, voice dictation programs go, the standard, the, the standard is Dragon Naturally Speaking. That's what I've used for years. I'm using Dragon Professional Individual 15 right now. There are a couple of other overlay programs that supercharge Dragon that I find really helpful. Uh, the biggest one being something called nobrainer.com. Uh, they also have great customer support, very cheap to pay for for a year. They have a great forum where you can get all your questions answered. 
Uh, and then I also have another overlay program called PCBY Speed Start. I haven't, um, apparently if I upgrade my no-brainer, I may not need to use PCBY Speed Start, but I haven't gotten there. So what you're trying to do with Dragon and no-brainer and Speed Start, or maybe just Dragon and no-brainer, is you're trying to set up a system so that you don't have to use your hands at all when you use the computer. That, that's what you're trying to do. And I can, unless I get macho and stubborn, I can not use my computer 90% of the time with my hands, with uh, those programs. But as far as voice dictation goes, Dragon is where you need to be. That, that is it. Any other questions? Yes, I believe that someone was um, also wanting to ask a verbal uh, question. Suggestions on how to find people with disabilities to help beta test. Uh, the Lighthouse for the Blind, if you have a Lighthouse for the Blind in your community, a lot of times they do this. Um, the I don't exactly know where to go for voice dictation users. There's often a match between screen reader and voice dictation, but not always. Uh, if you have a, a deaf community in your area, you can um, have them uh, see how the captions go. Uh, keep in mind with this automatic speech recognition, the captioning can be all over the place. You want to be able to make sure that the captioning works properly. Uh, no brainer is K-N-O-W-B-R-A-I-N-E-R. -E and the other one is correct. Uh, Dragon is Dragon Naturally Speaking. And then they have various different programs. Uh, Dragon has a program for legal, but it's a lot more money than the professional individual. If you have no brainer, you can put in, you can uh, set it up so that uh, you don't really need uh, Dragon uh, legal. If you're a litigator, you might want to consider Dragon legal. In my case, I don't litigate. I help people out with their litigation, but I don't litigate. And uh, I've never seen the need to pay for Dragon Legal because I've been able to program everything so that, for example, if I say Third Circuit Citation, you will see come up in my Word document, 3RD CIR period. So I program that. But if you're a litigator, you might want Dragon Legal. Uh, it's a lot more money than Dragon Professional. The uh, professional, you want to go with the professional because the professional allows you to import and export your vocabulary as you go from one uh, dragon uh, number to the next. So you go from 15 to 16 or you run into issues where your files get corrupted. Um, it, it's really important to have that backup capability. But uh, whether you go professional or legal depends on your practice. It may not be necessary to go legal. Any other questions? Yes. The, I had a question, if I could, just on the on the fees, the attorney fees component that you're discussing the range of three to twenty thousand. Uh, I'm talking about with the range of attorney fees that I'm talking about. We're talking about website accessibility litigation cases. Um, when it comes to architectural accessibility, that's also an area that uh, I've gotten involved with both as an attorney and as a consultant. In those situations, the standard settlement seems to be around four to $5,000. But with website accessibility, the settlements start around 3,000, can go as high as 20,000, depending upon the uh, issues that are involved. And again, under Title III of the ADA, the only thing you can get are attorney fees and injunctive relief. Those, those are the only things you can get as a plaintiff. So if you get sued for website inaccessibility, either you or one of your clients, they're going to be looking for attorney fees and basically an order to get you to clean it up and to settle it. Uh, if you settle with one person and you don't fix it, then the next one can gun for you too. That's the thing about Title III.
Any other questions? Just to let I would, I would say that um, thing to keep in mind, we're talking about website accessibility litigation here. If you're representing a governmental entity, that's a whole nother kettle of fish because the case law is quite clear that everything a governmental entity does have to be meaningfully accessible to people with disabilities. A third law that's out there is the Rehabilitation Act law of 1973. If you have uh, either the federal, the federal government, uh, there's, well, Rehabilitation Act 1973, if you take federal funds, you're subject to that law. So again, there's a lot of things going on here. And um, if you don't know what's going on here, you're not comfortable with it, get help. Those are wonderful points, Bill. Thank you so much. I will. Um, I know our time is coming to a close. If people happen to have final questions, feel, please feel free to write them in the chat um, or speak out loud as the other person did. But I just wanted to say you have given us such a wealth of information. This is um, very helpful. It's a, certainly a, a very complicated and evolving topic. And you being one of the foremost experts really helps give us a, a short introduction to this very important area. If there are no further questions, I also um, want to let attendees know that we will be providing a recording and slides on our website, masslomap.org. I want to speak, uh, thank our expert speaker today, Bill Gorin, again, for sharing his fantastic advice and his time with us. We are so grateful to have him with us. We want to thank all of you, too, for turning in. Um, we really appreciate your being here with us. We hope that you will mark your calendars for our next webinar for Busy Lawyers, which will be next month on February 17th at 12 p.m., and it will be the Heart Mind Heart Connection what lawyers need to know to maintain heart health and mental well-being with Lawyer Concerns for Lawyers' own Dr. Tracy Myers. So thank you for tuning in and have a terrific afternoon. And thank you especially, Bill, and for all of you for being with us today. I just